Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. Helicopters were invented around the same time as the airplane and entered military service just as quickly. With their ability to hover, travel at low speeds, and land and take off from virtually anywhere, militaries worldwide were quick to realize the helicopter's potential as a transport and weapons platform. Today, thousands of helicopters are assigned to ships all around the world. However, helicopters are much more susceptible to the impacts of extreme weather at sea. Indeed, several pilots have had difficulty landing and taking off from moving ships during storms. There are multiple vessels in the U.S. Navy fleet capable of carrying helicopters, with aircraft carriers and amphibious assault ships being the most common. LPDs, or landing platform docks, are also equipped with a range of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, including MV-22 Ospreys and CH-53 Super Stallions. The latter are powerful lift copters capable of carrying weapons, cargo, and personnel from ship to shore and back. With a fuselage length of 99 feet and three powerful General Electric T-64 engines, the average Super Stallion can carry up to 55 troops, or an internal payload of 32,000 pounds. Meanwhile, external hooks allow it to carry as much as 36,000 pounds. The Super Stallion also has a top speed of 200 miles per hour and can cover a range of up to 540 nautical miles before it needs to be refueled. Issues landing during rough weather are not something limited to just U.S. naval helicopters. This Danish MH-60R Seahawk is attempting to land atop the deck of a Thetis-class Arctic patrol ship. They are located near an archipelago called the Faroe Islands, where the Atlantic, North Sea, and Norwegian Sea meet. The ship itself is dealing with heavy waves, which do not present a welcoming platform for the incoming Seahawk. Fortunately, by coordinating with spotters aboard the ship, the helicopter hovers over the landing pad until the perfect moment to touch down appears. Though the Navy frequently has to deal with difficult weather situations, no branch of the U.S. military encounters more storms than the United States Coast Guard. In total, this search, rescue, and security organization has around 150 helicopters at its disposal. These include MH-60 Jayhawks as well as MH-65 Dolphins. Because incidents that require the mobilization of the Coast Guard are much more common during rough weather, these helicopters and their crews are frequently asked to perform during extreme conditions. Storms frequently cause large waves that can capsize boats and throw people overboard, 
It's the Coast Guard's job to get those locations of these incidents as quickly as possible and perform quick search and rescue services for the endangered sailors. Though largely active over the water, it's not uncommon for Coast Guard helicopters to participate in rescues throughout the United States. This is largely due to the fact that these crews are already so well suited to dangerous operations. Helicopters' unique capabilities make them a vital part of many military operations. One of the most dramatic of these is helocasting. Helocasting is an airborne technique generally used by small unit special forces. It's generally performed whenever a group needs to infiltrate an area behind enemy lines. There are several ways to perform this maneuver depending on the size of the force and the given situation. Generally, a helicopter will assume a position just above the water, slowing its airspeed down just enough so personnel can safely exit. In this case, the infiltration team simply jumps out of the side of the helicopter into the waiting water. From here, they can make their way ashore undetected. In some situations, a group might need to deploy with more equipment than they can carry, or further away from shore than they can swim. Under such conditions, it's common for the helocast to include one or more small boats. Such maneuvers also require a larger helicopter, such as the CH-47 Chinook. This twin-rotor aircraft has enough room for up to 55 troops and a large rear cargo ramp from which the Special Forces personnel can quickly eject themselves and their equipment. They first push the boat and other cargo into the water, then jump out themselves. As the helicopter remains moving the entire time, the chances of two soldiers landing atop one another are greatly minimized. A helocast can take place in all manner of conditions and involve a wide variety of troops and helicopter types. What is most important of all is that the troops move quickly when they reach the insertion point and get into the water as soon as possible. Retrievals can also take place using a helocast, though this maneuver is much rarer. When this happens, a line is dropped from the helicopter to the floating troops. Once they attach themselves to the rope with carabiners, the pilot will pull the helicopter up, taking the troops with them as they dangle beneath the aircraft. Ropes have always played an important role in allowing troops to exit a helicopter quickly. This process is known as fast roping, and it involves troops sliding down a thick rope in quick succession. It is generally reserved for situations where the helicopter can't touch down for some reason. Even when not done in a combat zone, the technique itself is quite dangerous. 
especially if troops are carrying heavy backpacks and weaponry. There is no time to attach each soldier to the rope with a descender, so their own gloved hands are the only thing controlling their descent. Special insertion and extraction, or SPY, refers to any situation in which troops need to be deployed quickly via helicopter. In recent years, the military has invested more time and man hours into preparing its troops for these types of operations. Practice is not limited to any one type of trooper, as there's no telling who might need to be extracted in the heat of battle. Extraction operations extend far beyond just transporting the troops themselves. In many cases, the military will be called upon to assist with hostage situations. This is where one or more people are being kept in a secure location against their will. In many cases, the assailants or enemies will be heavily armed and dug into a defensive position. In the case of the U.S. military, there are many special training camps specifically dedicated to hostage retrieval practice. These drills can sometimes use blanks and realistic conditions in order to simulate the real thing even better. In the end, the teams will be closely evaluated by professional trainers who provide feedback on their tactics. Sometimes helicopters and other vehicles play a role in the simulation as well. Special operations are a big deal among law enforcement and military organizations. In fact, an annual U.S. Special Operations Forces Industry Conference is held every year in Tampa, Florida. The event features various scenario-driven demonstrations, some of which will debut new techniques, equipment, or apparel. Extractions, insertions, and other maneuvers are common drills seen during ISOF, as are combat scenarios involving boats, helicopters, and more. The goal is to showcase the organized response capabilities of various teams while promoting the armed forces in general. In the end, it's training that separates successful operations from unsuccessful ones. Though it may seem odd to have helicopters and Humvees buzzing around Tampa firing weaponry, this is the best way to ensure everyone knows how to perform their jobs when the time comes for real action. Whether that action is landing a helicopter on a rolling ship, a rescue operation in the middle of the sea, or a helo cast deep into enemy territory, it's always better to be prepared. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.